only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to PGR's webinar, What to Expect on Your First PGR Audit. My name is Shannon Craddock. I will be your presenter today and your Programs and Accreditations Manager at PGR. Thank you for attending. We hope you find this webinar helpful. So you're aware, all participants have been muted to ensure sound quality. There will be plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. We ask that you type those into the chat or question feature um, as part of the webinar. And I'll address as many as possible at the conclusion of the lecture portion of the webinar. Copies of slides, as well as a digital recording of today's presentation, will be available on our website, www.pjr.com. Today's presentation will cover a number of topics. We're going to talk about what happens during a quotation stage and how we ensure an accurate, strategic, meaningful quote first time through. We'll talk about the pre-stage one activities, um, what we do to get ready to ensure your success and what you should be doing. We'll talk about what happens at the stage one audit versus the stage two audit. We'll talk about the need for revisit audits, why those are necessary and what will happen. Talk about what happens after the auditor leaves your site after that initial audit and what you should be doing. Um, we'll talk about the certificate decision and issuance process. And then when your issued certificate is in surveillance mode. So first let's discuss the quotation stage. Our application, which is our F1 form, um, and there's a number of forms depending on the standard you're trying to get certified to, is quite complex. <clears throat> we gather a lot of information about you up front because the more information that we gather about an applicant, the more competitive and meaningful our quote is first time through. If we were to gather less information, we may misquote you or make some, mis make some assumptions that are inaccurate and then have to bump up your time later on. Um, we want to try to get the most meaningful quote first time through. Um, honest and detailed responses from applicants alert us to potential logistical or readiness issues. And we can provide some feedback on how this may create a roadblock or a challenge. And then you can uh, address those head on prior to the stage one. Now the amount of time we quote is mandated by the International Accreditation Forum, or the IAF, mandatory document number five. That's the IAF MD5. It limits the discount that we can give um, on audit time to 30% of the days stipulated in that document. If you want to take a look at that document, go to publications at the website www.iaf.nu. So you can see for QMS, ISO 9001, and EMS, ISO 14001, the days that are mandated for a particular organization of a certain size and a certain risk level, and you'll see that PGR quotes within 30% of that. You want to watch out for competitors to PJR that may provide quotes that exceed this 30% discount. Those certification bodies would not be conforming with this document that they need to conform to in order to offer accredited certification. Once you contract with PJR, you will be, signed, you will be assigned to what's known as an Audit Program Coordinator, or APC, and you may refer to this as your scheduler, and they give they service any needs that you may have, and we call this our cradle to grave client management. So if you have a question about, you know, why you haven't gotten an audit plan, or a question on your invoice, or where does your audit packet stand in the certificate decision making process, reach out to your scheduler first, and they will answer as many questions as they can, and if they can, they'll point you in the right direction and get you to speak with somebody who can address your concerns. 
Schedulers try to assign an auditor that is qualified in your standard and competent in your technical area. Um, you may be a automotive client who deals with metal stamping. Um, they try to send a local automotive auditor who knows metal stamping. Um, we always try to send someone in a geographically friendly location to you to minimize travel costs and for you and travel time for auditors. Our scheduler will also require you to complete an attestation of readiness prior to your Stage 1 audit. Um, and this attestation is our F-108 series of documents. This document requires your organization to attest to your readiness for the Stage 1 audit. In most cases, you complete this document and submit some objective evidence that proves to PJR, yes, you are ready for the Stage 1 and there's a high degree of likelihood that it will be successful. For many of the quality-based standards, we request a copy of your quality manual, a list of process measurables, um, often referred to as KPIs and associated performance data, the PJR form F191, um, this is an optional form, um, but I cannot stress enough how important I think this form is. Evidence of your internal audit and internal auditor competency and management review records. Now for some standards, we don't require you to, you to submit any objective evidence. We just require you to attest to your readiness. Our technical staff at headquarters then reviews the completed F-108 and if, if submitted any evidence to see if there are any concerning areas which would prevent a successful Stage 1. They will alert you um, and if these issues are serious, they'll talk with you about pushing your Stage 1 further out into the future. We want to see you succeed and while we can't consult, we can tell you, you know, where there are serious deficiencies so that you can address these prior to the Stage 1 or perhaps consider rescheduling your Stage 1. Keep in mind the review that our technical staff does is a cursory review. They don't look at every single document in detail, so not all potential nonconformities or concerns will be identified. So if this cursory review reveals no issues, that doesn't necessarily mean that your Stage 1 will also reveal no issues. Once you progress to the Stage 1, um, those audits are typically conducted on-site. We may do off-site Stage 1 audits um, for some simple ISO 9001 management systems. This will save you travel costs because there isn't a travel event associated with the Stage 1, but the overall on-site and total audit time is higher. Um, so you want to weigh the savings and travel costs against the increased audit time. Stage 1 is largely a document review to ensure readiness and a plan for the Stage 2. There is a formal opening and closing meeting, um, and that might be held telephonically or via webinar if your Stage 1 is conducted off-site. So an important slide here, common Stage 1 failures. These are the, the most likely reasons you would be prevented from proceeding to the Stage 2. Um, First one is an inadequate or inappropriate interaction of processes. Section 4.1 of the standard requires you to document the interaction of processes. So some common pitfalls with this um, is one that remembers the Plan, Do, Check, Act diagram from the standard, a canned one from a consultant that truly doesn't match what you're doing. Your organization needs to document an interaction unique to your organization. Um, if you haven't listened to our webinar on process mapping and process-based internal audits, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. The interaction of processes is our, our first and single best indicator of how well your organization understands the process approach described in ISO 9001. Um, seasoned auditors folks can look at an interaction of processes and they'll know right away how that stage one is going to go and how you're going to perform on subsequent audits. This is a really big indicator of your understanding. Another common stage one failure is inadequate process measurables or process performance data. 
Clause 401E of ISA 9001 requires your organization to monitor and measure where applicable and analyze the processes that you've identified. Thus, every, every process on your interaction should be monitored or measured. And there should be performance data avail available to prove this monitoring or measurement. Some standards, such as ISO CS16949 and some of the aerospace standards, have minimum requirements for the amount of data that must be available. For all other standards, we simply need enough objective evidence to demonstrate that the process is working, that this, this concept of measuring and monitoring processes is working. Another common stage one failure is an inadequate internal audit. <clears throat> when we look at an internal audit, we're looking for records that include the following. An audit schedule that shows your plan for a year or longer period of time. An audit plan which shows the schedule of activities for a unique audit event. And notes or a report to show that all requirements are audit, audited. Um, we often see that notes of conformity are often lacking. So if in a given process no nonconformities were identified and no notes of conformity are documented, it doesn't look like you've audited that process. We would need records of any nonconformities that are in fact discovered and corrective actions to address any of these nonconformities. You want to make sure that auditors don't audit their own work. Keep in mind, we will conduct a stage one before the internal audit is completed. Um, if a specific standard allows it. However, our auditor is going to confirm that there's a plan to ensure that the audit does get completed prior to the stage two. And when you choose this approach, you do lose the benefit of feedback on your internal audit process prior to the stage two. Okay, another common stage one failure, internal auditor competency records. Um, I often ask to, for evidence that an internal auditor is competent, and one of the most common things they get is a copy of the certificate um, for a training class. It's probably very expensive. Um, this doesn't necessarily meet the competency requirements. As an organization, you need to define competency requirements for internal auditors and then show me that your auditors meet these competency requirements. It's this first step that's often missing, the organization defining competency requirements for internal auditors. <laughs> if your organization has a competency requirement to take a particular class, document that as a competency requirement, and then prove that your internal auditor meets that competency requirement. Another common stage one failure, management review. You want to make sure that your records prove that all inputs and outputs were addressed. Many organizations compile PowerPoint slides or a presentation that they show to their management team. Keep in mind that we also need records of the results of the discussions of these slides. The slides themselves are not record of a management review. Now, in between the Stage 1 and Stage 2 audits, there will be a minimum of 30 days. Um, some standards have specific requirements for six weeks between the Stage 1 and Stage 2, such as aerospace and R2. 60 to 75 days is preferred. That gives an organization, we feel, adequate time to appropriately address any Stage 1 concerns. If you schedule the Stage 1 and the Stage 2 with less than 21 days apart and the Stage 1 does not go well and we have to reschedule your Stage 2, you've already violated PGR's 21-day cancellation policy and there's a penalty for canceling an audit in less than 21 days. I often get requests for back-to-back -back audits. Um, in the history of PJR, we've, we've done these. Um, where the standard allows them to be done, and I have only seen one be successful. The rest end horribly. Um, so I would not recommend a back-to-back -back audit if it's even allowed by the given standard. You want to use the time between the Stage 1 and Stage 2 
to address any potential nonconformities or areas of concern identified in the Stage 1 report. If you fail to address these concerns, they will be elevated to major nonconformities on the Stage 2 audit. Prior to the Stage 2, you should receive an audit plan. Your audit always starts with an opening meeting. Keep in mind that the lead auditor notices who is present. If your management team is not making an effort to attend, your top executives aren't there, that's typically cause for concern. At the conclusion of the opening meeting, the audit is then conducted in accordance with the audit plan using a process, process approach. Our auditors are going to ask about your processes, what they are. They're going to talk to each process owner and they're going to ask them how do they know how their process is doing or performing and what do they do if the target for process performance isn't met. These questions really are the basis of a process audit. Hey Mr. Process Owner, how do you know how your process is doing? Um, they, the ideal response is that that process owner talks to performance of the process against the key performance indicator or shares monitoring results. And the next question is, what do you do, process owner, if the target for process performance is not being met? And the ideal response there is taking some type of corrective action. Once our auditor has answers to these questions, the auditor will then make sure that this is what is happening in practice. So the preliminary questions that they've learned the answers to in interviewing the process owner, they'll go out and verify or corroborate the anecdotal evidence that they've learned. And they do this through document record review, interviewing the lower level people who actually do the work, and by making observations, watching people do their work. <clears throat> A closing meeting is held, and this is where the lead auditor presents audit results and the, their recommendation to PGR's Executive Committee, which is our decision-making body. Keep in mind the lead auditors not get to decide if the organization is certified or not. They make a decision, make a recommendation to our decision-making body. Therefore, their report must contain copious evidence of conformity and evidence that the nonconformities have been appropriately addressed in order to support their recommendation for certification. Now, before the lead auditor exits your facility, they need to leave a copy of any nonconformity reports with you. During the Stage 2 audit, or any audit that PGR conducts, it's our expectation that every single nonconformity is documented as such. If an auditor doesn't write something up that truly is a nonconformity, it leads to the organization simply making a quick fix, and often the problem occurs because the organization does not do a root cause analysis, determine the true root cause, and eliminate that root cause to prevent recurrence. So every auditor doing the right thing every time leads to consistency. <clears throat> Regardless of who the auditor is, you're going to get consistent results. And we feel that's the key to client satisfaction. You never want an audit where an auditor <clears throat> on the 2013 audit tells you you're doing great and there are no issues. And then in 2014, nothing changes in your organization and someone writes up 10 majors. Um, if all auditors are doing the right thing and documenting every finding every time, we're going to see consistency and that's going to drive improvement. Common stage two failures. <clears throat> Important slide here. These are the most common nonconformities we see. Failure to determine the necessary competence for personnel performing work affecting quality. We often see employee files with training records, but I have no idea if those training records address all the identified competency needs for a given position because no competency needs are identified. Inadequate records of supplier evaluation and reevaluation. Inadequate corrective actions, those with poor root cause or corrective action. Lack of a preventive action process. 
evidence that you're truly considering all inputs to your preventive action process and acting on them when appropriate. Document control issues, uh, record issues, and then calibration. There's always gauges that are calibrated. A teacher will do a revisit audit, and these are typically on site, but they can be done off site. If there are a number of nonconformities or serious nonconformities, called major nonconformities, whose implementation cannot be verified remotely. Adequate preparation and sufficient time between the stage one and stage two will minimize the likelihood of the need for a revisit. Just a few slides ago, I mentioned that when an auditor, before an auditor leaves your facility, they should leave you with copies of any nonconformity reports. Now, the final audit report ideally will be left with you before the auditor departs. If not, they get seven days to complete it. You then get 60 days to address any nonconformities. Keep in mind, some sectors such as aerospace require responses more quickly. PGR requires containment as applicable, correction, root cause, and corrective action. For major nonconformities, full evidence of implementation of corrective action must also be submitted. I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to check out our webinar on root cause and corrective action. When you're doing your root cause analysis, I encourage you to take your time with this process. Use a multidisciplinary or cross-functional approach to ensure acceptance of your responses first time through. After the lead auditor accepts your corrective action responses, the audit package is reviewed by PGR's Executive Committee, which is our decision-making body. As I stated earlier, there has to be copious evidence to convince the executive committee reviewer that the lead auditor's recommendation to certify the company or not to certify them is the correct one. So we need substantial notes of conformity, clear conclusions regarding process effectiveness, and if there are any nonconformities, the organization needs to have submitted sound responses to convince the re reviewer that the nonconformities will not recur i.e. that you've identified the true root cause and corrective action. If the executive committee concurs with the lead auditor's recommendation to certify, then a certificate is issued. The certificate effective date will be the date of executive committee approval of the audit package. It is not the date of your audit. It's the date when the executive committee approves the audit package. The certificate is good for a period of three years, and the scope statement written on that certificate should reflect only what was audited, no more, no less. When you receive a copy of your certificate, you also receive a copy of PGRS Pro 3. This is the procedure that outlines requirements for proper usage of our registration mark and logo and the registration marks and logos of our accreditation bodies. You want to be careful how you advertise your certification. So if only part of your scope of activity is certifying, um, as a business, if you make picture frames and baby clothes, but you've only certified the manufacturer of picture frames, then you want to make sure that when you advertise your certification, it's very clear that only picture frame manufacturer is certified. If you're a multi-sited facility and only some sites are certified, you need to make sure that you don't misadvertise to lead the end user to believe that all sites are certified. After you're certified, congratulations, you are now in surveillance mode. Surveillance audits are conducted once a year or more, um, so typically once a year, but some folks choose the option of every six months. Most clients are contracted annually, um, as this tends to be the most cost-effective option. We only have one travel event a year as opposed to two. 
Um, some clients are required to convert to a semi-annual surveillance mode if their management system is weak. Um, and this is based on the recommendation of the lead auditor and the decision of the executive committee. Um, the client will be told that this has to happen. Um, and oftentimes we don't give the client a choice. Um, if they want to continue to be certified, they have to submit to six months surveillance. Now the due date for your surveillance audits is determined by the last day of the stage two in your first audit cycle or the last day of your recertification audit for subsequent audit cycles. It's not determined from the certificate effective date. Now keep in mind that the very first surveillance audit after the stage two must be conducted within 365 days of the stage two. So this is only going to affect those clients on annual surveillance there's an absolute requirement that you have to get that first audit done within 365 days of the stage two. And the reason for this is if a management system is going to fall apart or show signs of weakness, it's in that first year after certification. I often analogize it to cramming for an exam. You're all ready for that initial audit, but then you tend to lose or fail to retain the knowledge as time goes on after that exam is over. Surveillance audits are shorter in duration than the initial audit. That's the stage one and stage two. And they're about one-third the initial audit time. We don't look at all the requirements of the standard. Um, the requirements are sampled using a risk-based approach. Problem areas on the stage two audit or prior audit will be reviewed on that first surveillance audit. And things like management review, internal audits, and corrective action are covered on every audit, as there are such fundamental concepts in most management systems. Recertification audits are conducted at the end of a certification cycle, prior to certificate expiry. There are two-thirds the initial audit time, and here all requirements are audited, just like in the initial audit. Okay, folks, that ends the lecture portion of today's presentation. I will now open the floor up to any questions that you may have. You will call that to ensure sound quality. We've muted all the participants. So please type in any questions into the chat feature. And I'll wait just a minute while you type in any questions you may have. So I'm going to see if we have any questions, folks. And again, copies of this presentation, the slides, and the recording will be available on our website, www.pjr.com. You can also access previously recorded webinars on different topics, as well as see a list of our upcoming webinars for calendar year 2014. from Scott, what are the typical requirements for internal auditors? Um, Scott, an organization sets their own competency requirements for internal auditors. The standard does not stipulate any requirements, but you want to make sure that those requirements make sense. Um, and I often give the example of the competency requirements for an internal auditor are the ability to stand on one's head and juggle. Those don't really make sense, but if the competency requirements are understanding of the given standard, ISO 9001, for example, um, the ability to compile an audit plan, the ability to ask meaningful questions and draw conclusions, the ability to write an appropriate nonconformity, the ability to compile an audit report, and the ability to evaluate the acceptability of corrective action responses. No, those certainly are meaningful competency requirements. Now, how those competency requirements are met by an organization is also that organization's decision. 
They may choose to attend a training class. They may train one person in their organization who in turn trains others. People can meet those requirements through self-study or through witness audits. And a question from Martin about the two webinars I recommended, process mapping and process-based internal audits and root cause analysis and systemic corrective action. Martin, those webinars and others are available on our website. <laughs> Go to www.pjr.com. On the home page, about halfway down on the right-hand side, you'll see a link to webinars, and you can look at recordings of previous webinars. Wait a few more minutes to see if any questions come in. We don't have a lot of participants today, so um, there's a very high likelihood your question will get answered. And you may ask a question about today's presentation or anything related to management systems. I'd be more than happy to address any questions. Unless I don't know the answer. Joanne's asking if the internal audit can be front, can be if the internal audit can be outsourced. Um, yes, it certainly can. You just want to make sure that the internal auditor you choose to use, the outsourced internal auditor, meets the competency requirements you define for internal auditors. And a training certificate in a file will not meet that requirement. The organization has to define what the competency requirements are first. Thanks, Joanne. We'll wait just a few more minutes to see if there are any other questions. I'll be more than happy to address questions on anything, any standard, or anything related to management systems as well as today's presentation. Uh, Scott has a great question. Other than surveys, what are some of the mechanisms you see to document customer satisfaction? Um, one of the when I audit, the very first thing I ask for is evidence of customer satisfaction. Now, if you have a customer, as, as often happens in the automotive and aerospace industries, that provides you with scorecards or report cards, that's great. You, the work is done for you. Um, surveys are another tool, although the response rate tends to be low. Often depends on how the survey is administered, Scott, or if there's an incentive to complete it. Um, lack of customer complaints could be evidence of customer satisfaction. Um, evidence of repeat orders could be other evidence of customer satisfaction. Um, sometimes you have to proactively reach out to your customers and ask them for feedback.
feedback as opposed to sending them a survey. Joanne's asking a question. I think this relates to the outsourcing of internal audits. Can the auditor work at another company and send in their certification to your company and only be used for internal audits at your company? Well, it doesn't matter if this person audits for your company and two or 22 others, Joanne. What you want to make sure is that if this person is doing audits for you, that they meet your competency requirements that your organization has outlined for internal auditors. Now, if in that training class, when you say they send their certification in, um, the training class clearly covers all your competency requirements, then that certificate may be enough. Um, but that certificate probably didn't tra to include anything related to training that individual on your own internal audit procedure and forms. And certainly somebody conducting internal audits on your behalf would need to know your system and your protocol for internal audits. So you would want to make sure that they were at least trained in that. Let's see if we get any more questions. Okay, folks, it appears that we're not getting any more questions. I thank you for your time today and hope you found this webinar helpful. Please tune into our website, pjr.com, for information on upcoming webinars. Thank you. Have a great day.